Good afternoon and uh, welcome to Grand Rounds today. Uh, please remember to sign the attendance record at the back of the auditorium and also please remember to fill out the uh, program evaluations. We're always interested in your thoughts regarding future topics or future speakers. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Amy Calhoun. Uh, Dr. Calhoun uh, received her MD degree from the Mayo School of Medicine and then she did her pediatrics residency at the University of Iowa and then uh, did a residency in uh, genetics uh, at the University of Utah before returning to the University of Iowa where she is a clinical associate professor in pediatrics and genetics and genomics. And she has kindly accepted our invitation today to come over to Ames and provide us uh, with a, a review of newborn screening. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Amy Callahan. Thank you so much. That was a nice, uh, nice, that's probably one of the better introductions I've ever had, thank you. Um, so um, well, I think he knows where everything I did actually is, so that's always helpful. Um, so I was gonna talk a little bit about newborn screening and thanks for letting me come. Um, I'm also the medical director of the newborn screening program for the state of Iowa, which is why I get to talk about this topic. And actually, Ashley Comer is here with me. She's um, our quality assurance officer from the lab, from the newborn screening lab. So when we get to question time, she can answer some questions too. <laughs> All right, so um, I do have a couple disclosures. I am the site PI for the phenylketonuria registry. So that's the registry that we use to track our patients with phenylketonuria, which is one of the conditions that we pick up on the newborn screen. And I'm actually gonna talk about it a little bit later. And the registry is funded by Biomarin, which is one of the pharma companies that makes PKU medications. And that's really my only disclosure. I'm not gonna talk about any of those meds today, but they do give us a little bit of research funding. And so that is related to this talk. Okay, um, so what am I trying to talk about today? So I wanted to review some of the strengths and weaknesses of newborn screening, because this is something that, I don't know what you guys all got in your training, but I think I got about 10 minutes, maybe, on newborn screening at some point during medical school, and then it really wasn't mentioned again, and then maybe I got another 10 minutes in my peds residency at some point. So this is, even though this is something that happens to almost every baby in this state, we have incredibly high uptake in Iowa. We have really good um, public health programming here. Um, most of us don't actually have that much familiarity with it. And then I want to talk a little bit about where things are going. Okay, so one of the most important things to remember about newborn screening is that it's a screen. So it's not diagnostic, it's a screening test. So screening tests are something that's done on a large population of people who are well appearing, who are well, or at least look well, and you use it typically to separate a low risk group from a high risk group, and then you do additional testing on your high risk group. So, um, <clears throat> so if you think about something like another type of screening you might do, like a um, mammogram or something, you often, the mammogram doesn't tell you whether you have breast cancer, it just tells you whether you have something concerning and then you have to go get a biopsy. Um, so, um, <clears throat> and as opposed to a diagnostic test, which the biopsy would be a diagnostic test, it actually tells you whether or not you actually have cancer. So that's a really important piece of information to remember about newborn screening. Um, another thing about newborn screening, it's a public health program. They are state run. So every state is different. So the Iowa newborn screening program is different from, for example, Minnesota's newborn screening program, Wisconsin's newborn screening program, Missouri's newborn screening program. So everything I'm gonna tell you really mostly applies to our program. Um, <clears throat> there is a very limited federal role. So there's a committee called, we usually pronounce ACDUNC, the Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders in Newborns and Children. And I have to write it on my slide and read it because I can never remember what it stands for. Um, this is, it's, it's an advisory. See, the first letter is advisory. So none, nothing they do is actually binding to any of the states. And um, that was started in 2015. And they advise the uh, Health and Human Services Secretary nationally about newborn screening. And it updates the recommended uniform screening panel which I'll get to a little bit more, but um, this is not binding. The, imp the important thing to remember about the federal rule for newborn screening is not binding on the states. It's advisory. 
Okay, so here's the rest. So I was gonna talk a little bit about the rest. So this is the recommended uniform screening panel. And again, ACDUNC provides this. So this is a federal recommendation. So they make a list of conditions that the federal government recommends to states to screen for. And it's approved by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. It is not binding. And I know I said that already, but that's important to remember. They divide it into core conditions and secondary conditions. So the core conditions are the things we're looking for. We're doing the screen to look for these specific disorders. And secondary conditions are things you might pick up while you're looking for the core condition. For example, if you're ultrasounding someone's liver because you think they have gallbladder disease and then you see a hap happen to see a liver tumor while you're in there, of course you're gonna address that. So secondary condition is something that you might pick up while you're looking for the primary conditions that you would then wanna follow up on. <coughs> okay, there are actually three components to newborn screening. So, <clears throat> one component is newborn hearing screening. And then another component is critical congenital heart disease screening. And the third component, my personal favorite, because I'm a metabolic geneticist, is newborn blood spot screening. So, newborn hearing screening is relatively new. It was added to the recommended screenings in 2011. Not every state currently mandates newborn hearing screening. And I've got in fine print there. Who doesn't? Um, most newborns in the United States do get hearing screening. And um, the reason we screen, the reason we do newborn hearing screening is prior to newborn hearing screening, um, hearing loss was typically identified between two and a half and three years of age. And lots and lots of children with deafness were not identified until five to six years of age. And if Deafness or hearing impairment is identified after six months of age. You have serious permanent language impairments in children. And so we have to pick up hearing loss early in life and manage it right away in order to preserve normal language function, whether that's sign or speech. And um, <clears throat> people are really bad at telling whether children can hear. And there's a big difference between hearing this and understanding my speech. So just because you turn around, if I drop something really loudly over here, doesn't mean you can functionally hear speech and have language. So that's a big deal. Um, <clears throat> critical congenital heart disease screening was formally recommended in 2010. Um, this is kind of tricky. It's designed to pick up ductal dependent heart disease lesions. So, um, so your target lesions are horrible things like hypoplastic left heart, pulmonary atresia, tetralogy of flow, total anomalous pulmonary venous return. So these very, very serious congenital heart defects where the baby can actually look fine when they come out and then the ductus closes and then they can almost drop dead. And so that's the idea of picking it up. It's done with pulse, pulse oximetry. Um, you do the right hand and the right foot. I've got the typical protocol listed here. So it's a little complicated. Um, so you can see that the protocol here for the testing is actually kind of intense. You have to do this and then you gotta do it again, and then you gotta do it again, and then wait an hour, do it again. And then finally, so this actually, if you're doing this right, this can this is pretty intense process. Um, so it's also not super great test. So the sensitivity is maybe only 60% which if you remember when we're trying to do screening, you're really kind of, with screening, you're trying to have good sensitivity. And sometimes we sacrifice specificity, but we're actually shooting for sensitivity. Sensitivity is our goal in newborn screening. So critical congenital heart disease screening isn't anywhere near perfect, but it's, most people would argue it's better than nothing. So <clears throat> now moving on to newborn blood spot screening, which is my personal favorite. I have a little bias here. So, Sometimes I don't address the other components enough. Um, so newborn blood spot screening, which is sort of the original component of newborn screening, um, was made possible by Dr. Dr. Robert Guthrie. So he developed a screening test for phenylketonuria in the 1950s. And I don't have any idea how he came up with the idea that we could drip some blood onto a piece of filter paper and use that for testing. But that is what makes newborn blood spot screening possible. And um, screening programs for PKU began in the 60s and were widespread relatively quickly. 
Um, and then we gradually started adding additional disorders in the 1980s. So the only thing I was newborn screened for was PKU. Um, the interesting thing is in 2003, so you know, it starts in the 60s, then we start adding a few other things in the 80s. 2003, 45 states were screening for six disorders, which I have listed there. Some were screening for up to 50, and some screened only four. So um, there's, this is where, remember I was talking about how there are state-based tests. So this is, there's a lot of variability. Um, that was around when they actually formed ACDUNC and put together the recommended unified screening panel. Most states now screen for around 50 disorders. And it kind of depends how you count them. Um, because if you're a lump or a splitter, you can kind of divide, especially some of the weird little metabolic disorders, you can divide them up a bunch or you can lump them together. So sometimes states will be like, we screen for, you know, some number of disorders. And sometimes that's a little bit of an exaggeration, depending whether you're a lump or a splitter. So I usually just say around 50. Um, <clears throat> so what do we screen for in Iowa? Remember I talked about core conditions and secondary conditions. So we have... Both of the non-blood spot components, we do hearing screening and con critical congenital heart disease screening. Um, I'm not obviously expecting anyone to remember any of these conditions. And I can say all of these things because I practice saying them, but a lot of these are really weird, rare disorders that only a metabolic geneticist would actually have to know. Um, we screen for some amino acid disorders and urea cycle disorders. We screen for several organic acidemias fatty acid oxidation disorders. Now, the famous ones in here, so your amino acid disorders, here's PKU right here. And then um, sometimes people have heard of glutaric acidemia type 1 or GA1 because that one has um, uh, is on the differential diagnosis for child abuse. So you always have to work, if you have a, doing a child abuse workup, you have to look for that. Um, sometimes people have heard of MCAT and the fatty acid oxidation disorders because this was a significant component of skid death prior to newborn screening. Okay. Um, we also screen for two endocrine disorders, congenital adrenal hyperplasia and primary congenital hypothyroidism. And probably primary congenital hypothyroidism is one of our number one call outs. We also screen for hemoglobinopathies, sickle cell anemia. Um, we actually, because of the way we screen for hemoglobinopathies, we will screen for whatever we can find from a hemoglobin perspective. We also screen for, or there's our other category, um, which includes biotinidase cystic fibrosis, skid, and classic lactosemia. Okay, we have a bunch of other secondary conditions. Not gonna go into them, but there they are. So we can pick up a bunch of other things while we're, while we're looking for our primary conditions. Okay, so what don't we screen for? Um, Right now, there are a few disorders that are on the recommended uniform screening panel that we do not screen. So there's core conditions of mucopolysaccharidosis type 1, Pompe disease, X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy, and SMA. So, but we're working on that one. Um, and then there's some secondary conditions that we do not screen for as well. They're listed there. <clears throat> Most of those people haven't heard of, so I don't go into them too de detailed. Um, so because states can do different things, there are a bunch of disorders that are screened at least somewhere in the U.S. that are not on the RUSP. Um, there's some really unusual organic aciduria's, which you don't have to worry about too much. Additional amino acid disorders. Um, and then other states, there's a bunch of other... Um, lysosomal conditions that are screened in many states. Some states actually screen at birth for HIV. There are a few states that were screening briefly for Zika, and some states screen for CMV, cytomegalovirus. Okay, so what is numerous screening for? The goal of numerous screening is to pick up newborns with lifelong treatable conditions and to start treating them before they get permanent injury. Okay, strengths of newborn screening. So we have a pretty good program. We, um, we screen more than 95% of our newborns in Iowa. So we're getting most of our newborns, that's a strength. We are very fast. This is because of our awesome lab. We have the fastest 
newborn screening program in the world. Our lab is staffed, not 24 hours, it's actually 20 hours. There's a little short break in there. Right, Ash? I have 24, but it's not quite. It's 20 hours a day, seven days a week. We are the envy of the world for our lab staffing and speed. Um, newborn screening is minimally invasive. We have two non-invasive bedside tests and five spots on a filter paper. And that gives you more than 50 diseases, which I think is incredibly impressive. So challenges. It's a screen, right? It's not a diagnostic test. This is just a screen. And then another big challenge, picking what we put on there. And then the other issue is our target disorders tend to be very rare. So because it's a screen, it needs to be cheap. Um, because it's a screen, we need to have a very low false negative rate, i.e. needs to be very sensitive. Usually when you're going for high sensitivity, you lose specificity. So you get a lot of false positives. The other thing is, the more rare diseases, the more false positives you're going to get in proportion to true positives. Um, it's just used to find a high risk group for a lot of our conditions. Some sort of follow-up testing is required. So you don't just get a yes, no answer right from the screen itself, which is a burden on providers and patients. So um, choosing target disorders is really challenging. These are the wilson Jungner criteria, the traditional criteria for newborn screening. Um, <clears throat> so instead of reading you these, I'm actually just going to go through what is a good condition for newborn screening. PKU is widely considered one of the best conditions for newborn screening. They're born asymptomatic and they cannot metabolize phenylalanine. Phenylalanine is an amino acid that is found in every single protein you eat. And when you break down proteins, you get a bunch of phenylalanine, and then you need to break that down, and they can't. Phenylalanine is directly toxic to the brain. Causes, over time, it causes irreversible brain damage and leads to severe intellectual disability, and they self-injure, too, so it's great. They, like, bite their hands and hit themselves. Um, so it's, it's a really untreated, it's a really miserable disease. If you start a low phenylalanine diet prior to two weeks of age, you do not get intellectual disability. In fact, people who are started on diet prior to two weeks of age and maintained on diet through childhood have normal cognitive outcomes. So we have people with master's degrees, doctoral degrees, running around, you never know. So what's great is, if you treat patients before symptoms occur, they have normal lifespan and normal adult function. And if you miss it, severe intellectual disability, nonverbal self-injury. That's a huge difference. So you can see why this would matter. Okay. A poor target for newborn screening. Not that anyone would newborn screen for Huntington's disease, but just an ex as an example, Huntington's disease would be a terrible target for newborn screening because it's adult onset, it's incurable, there's no treatment. And when you ask people who are at 50% risk, because they have a parent, this is an autosomal dominant disorder, if your parent has it, you have 50% chance of having it. Over half of children of people who have Huntington's disease choose not to be tested. So we do feel in genetics that people have a right not to know information. You have a right to know, but you also have a right not to know if you would like not to. So we try not to inflict knowledge on people that they wouldn't want to know. And because newborn screening is an opt-out test, it happens unless you say you don't want it. This would remove the choice from somebody if they would decide as an adult they don't want to know something. So we purposely avoid untreatable adult onset conditions. Okay. So... So those two were easy when you're choosing target disorders. Like PKU is so obviously a good choice. Huntington's is so obviously a bad choice. We have good documentation about how people feel about finding out whether they have Huntington's disease. It's much harder if the treatment, so it's gotta be a treatable condition. It's much harder if the treatment is only partially effective or if it's only effective for some patients. Another problem, what if the treatment is really, really expensive? So if you've been following along with what's going on with spinal muscular atrophy right now, you know that the treatments for spinal muscular atrophy are incredibly expensive. So they just approved a um, gene therapy, which is so cool. I did not think when I started training there was going to be safe and effective gene therapy in my career. I really didn't. People would talk about it, like, oh, we're going to have gene therapy in two years. And when I started 
we were killing people with gene therapy. And I was like, this is not going to be safe and effective before I retire. Well, joke's on me. But anyway, it costs so much money. I think it's on the order of a million dollars or more than that. Um, another question, what if you have trouble telling who actually has the condition? So some of the things on the newborn screen already, I have to do very exhaustive testing um, in my clinic to figure out whether they actually have it or they're just a carrier for that condition or don't have anything at all. Um, I have several layers of testing I have to do for one of my conditions. Some of the other things that are being considered for adding on the panel, we actually can't quite tell always if someone will ever have any symptoms. A good example would be the mildest end of Crabbe and Pompeii. We don't know. We, we find people on numerous screening. We don't know if they're ever going to have any problems. And then you follow them for their whole lives worrying about these terrible conditions and maybe they won't even ever get sick. We don't know. So, um, and then what if we have limited data on these disorders? Some of them are very rare. Now I'm going to tell you a story about a newborn screening mistake. The tragic tale of SCAD. SCAD is short-chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency. It was originally described in the 1980s. It is an extremely rare genetic disorder of fat metabolism. So... So there's other related disorders on the panel, MCAD and VLCAD, medium chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency, and VLCAD. They're very, those are very serious, well-understood conditions that are on the newborn screen. We routinely save lives by newborn screening for this disorder. MCAD is actually pretty rapid onset, and we have had times where our short-term follow-up nurses have called and reached the family, and the baby was in a crisis right when they called. So MCAD is a very important newborn screen disorder. So the patients with SCAD reported to have lethargy, vomiting, acidosis, death, seizures, delays. It was treated with diet modification and fasting avoidance, which isn't, that's not too hard in the grand scheme of burdensome therapies. Um, the diagnostic metabolite is easily detected. So you can tell if somebody has this. Okay, so far so good. So it was added to the newborn screen in the late 90s, early 2000s, kind of depending what state you're in. Then we found it everywhere, in clinically well adults. Um, we found it in parents of children who had screened positive. They, so the kid would have SCAD and their dad would have SCAD and he was completely fine. Or their mom would have SCAD or everyone in their family had SCAD. And no one followed prospectively got sick. So then we looked back and looked at the people who had SCAD that was what was wrong with them. All the people who were ill from their SCAD had a second condition because SCAD is super common. So the finding of the SCAD markers and their illness were true, true, and unrelated. Turns out it's not a disease. It's a biochemical variant. So even though it's still on the RUSP, states nationwide have been quietly just taking off their panels still in the rest. So newborn screening proved SCAD wasn't a disease. So we didn't have enough information when we put it on the screen. Newborn screening is not the right way to find out whether something's a disease or not, right? Does anyone think this is a good way to evaluate whether it's not? Uh, exactly. So how do you know what you don't know, right? This, we're going into the unknown unknowns here. Okay. So, <clears throat> I don't know how you don't know what you don't know, but anyway. So, another challenge, target disorders are rare. So, um, here's two things that are on our screen that we've struggled with because they're rare. So, we've never found an arginase in Iowa. Arginase is on the screen. It's a very serious, serious cycle disorder. We've never found one in Iowa. It's extremely rare. How do I know I didn't miss one? How do I know if I have a false negative rate it's extremely rare, and actually when you run the stats, it's so rare, based on when we added it to the, new, the newborn screen and how rare it is, it's actually okay that I haven't found one yet, but it makes me a little nervous. Then there's skid screening. Took us too long to find one based on the prevalence in the population. Um, we've con con we confirmed our first skid in 2018, and we should have, by statistics and population incidents, we should have had one before that. Who'd we miss? I don't know. How do we know? Or did we? I mean, there weren't any babies that showed up with skid that we know of that we should have screened positive. But so that is a trick when it's rare. Okay, then there's this issue of new conditions. So 
we say new conditions, we're usually talking about these, these three disorders here. X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy, so that's a progressive um, neurological disorder. And mucopolysaccharidosis type 1, which is most people learned Hurler. Well, if you're my age or older, you probably learned Hurler syndrome when you were training. Um, and then shy is the milder, so that gets lumped together in into MPS1. Um, and then Pompe disease, which is sometimes called glycogen storage disease type 2. It's not actually a glycogen storage disease. It's actually a paroxysmal disorder. It's also sometimes called acid maltase deficiency. This is the trouble with these rare diseases. I'm so sorry they have more than one name. Um, and then sometimes people are also including spinal muscular atrophy in this group. Um, and sometimes they just people, so when people say new conditions, sometimes they mean those three there, those first three, sometimes they mean these four, and sometimes they mean anything that's under consideration. So, um, <clears throat> so some issues with these particular conditions. Um, these are things that we are actively considering. Um, so XALD is extremely variable. So in, in the same family, so people with the exact same gene change causing it, the same family, you can have people who are clinically well, well into adulthood, or children who have horrible neurodegeneration in early childhood in the same family. So we can't tell who's going to get sick and when, and the treatment is a bone marrow transplant, but you're supposed to do the bone marrow transplant right before they start to fall apart neurologically. Very tricky. And of course, a bone marrow transplant is not a benign therapy. If you've ever participated in taking care of someone who's had a bone marrow transplant. Um, MPS1, MPS1 treatment is extremely expensive and it's only partially effective. So MPS1 has multi it affects your whole body, affects your airway, affects your joints, affects your bones, also affects your brain. Developmental, developmental delay and regression are part of the condition. Developmental delay and regression are the least well-managed symptom with the therapy. So the therapy does a good job of addressing the systemic um, effects, but doesn't resolve the developmental delay and is incredibly expensive. It's also an intravenous infusion. So that's another piece of it. Again, Pompeii, Pompeii is usually prevents with, presents with cardiomyopathy. It's another storage disorder. Its treatment is also very difficult and very expensive. It's, an enz it's a recombinant enzyme infusion. And the most severe patients tend to pr produce a significant immune response to the therapy. So that's a huge problem. And then SMA, treatment is amazingly expensive. It's amazingly expensive. And we don't have any long-term data on the treatment. So most of our data on the treatment for SMA goes out only six years, which is not... So, you know, if you save somebody's life, what if something terrible happens, happens to them when they're 20? We don't actually know that. So... And then, as we're looking forward here, <clears throat> so we're sort of thinking about all of these things that we could be doing, could be adding to this screen. And then we also have the question of some of the new technologies. You know, as you all know, genetics is moving very, very fast. We have tons of new stuff we're doing all the time, tons of new technologies. Um, one of the big pieces is high throughput, massively parallel, what's called next generation sequencing. Um, so this allows us to run huge gene panels all at the same time. Um, most major genetic testing labs have already moved to this technology. And now you can order, from when I started training in genetics, I can order hundreds of genes for half the cost of what one one gene costs when I started training. And I'm not like ancient yet. So um, um, so this is amazing. And actually many, many people have proposed large scale gene sequencing as first tier screen. So to use genetic testing as our newborn screen. Several groups have proposed this. They've actually run small pilot projects in various places. It's important to remember this would not pick up congenital hypothyroidism. Congenital hypothyroidism is not usually genetic. Um, and then there's a lot of ethical issues and other problems with using screening as a primary test. Um, there's also digital microfluidics. This is the technology that we usually use to screen for lysosomal disorders. Um, and it does high throughput enzyme-based and immunologic testing if we have any path, uh, ClinPath people here. Okay, so what we're working on right now in the Iowa newborn screen is trying to improve our performance. We would like to improve particularly our specificity. 
Um, we are moving towards binning our thyroid, our TSH level. So this is, we're looking for um, hypothyroidism and the gestational age of an individual. So if you're a preemie, that really affects your TSH levels um, and also how old you are. Um, and we're working, we actually are in the process of impl implementing a binning strategy. So if anybody here works in NICUs ever and has to struggle with thyroid testing, this should really help with that. We're also getting gestational age cutoffs for methionine. Methionine is also associated highly with prematurity. Um, we are also working on age cutoffs for leucine. Leucine is one of our very problematic false positives that we get. Leucine levels increase as a baby gets older. So much lower at 24 hours of age. And if you happen to get the screen later, or if you repeat the screen because at a funny TSH level, then their leucine is going to be over the cutoff because as you're fed, your leucine level comes up. So we do assess the performance of all our metabolic testing at least twice a year. And we are working on implementing integrated second tier testing. So we are in the process of looking at um, adding some sequencing into the numerous screen itself. Okay, so I was going to talk to you a little bit about who does numerous screening. So numerous screening is a um, program of the Iowa Department of Public Health. And our executive officer is Kim Piper. And uh, she was an OB nurse for many years before she went into public health. And then Tammy and Shalom are our um, hearing screen follow-up team. So if you have questions about the newborn hearing portion, they're your ladies. And then, Ashley, this is the best I could do on lab pictures. <laughs> the Iowa Newborn Screening Lab is uh, located on the DMAC campus. It's part of the State Hygienic Laboratory at the University of Iowa. So our State Hygienic Lab is our state public health lab. There's a campus, there's a, a lab in here in Ankeny on DMAC. And then there's actually another component of the lab that's in Coralville, just north of Iowa City. But the newborn screening happens here in Ankeny. And um, if you have questions for the lab, there's, is that the right phone number? Oh, good. If you have questions for the lab, particularly about getting forms or supplies, there's a phone number. They're always happy to send you more supplies if you need them. Um, here's our, here's our follow-up team. So if you get a positive newborn screen, one of these ladies will call you or your office. They will try to call you. They will also fax you some educational materials, including the result and what to do next. We try really, really hard not to leave you hanging. Um, and so if you see one of these ladies calling you, um, here's our contact information here. So if you have questions about a screen, whether normal or abnormal, or about a baby who has been screened or needs to be screened, this is, here's our group here. So this is, these are our short-term follow-up nurses. And then Carol's our coordinator. There's me. And then we have two genetic counselors who can provide phone genetic counseling related to numerous screening if you have a family that needs that. And that is free through the program. And then we also have a bunch of medical consultants for our other weird, just all our weird disorders that we screen for. So if you need next level consultation with a medical consultant, we have um, lots of people to help with that. Um, you can, and you can always get me as well if you have a question about a weird metabolic genetic disorder, because usually those are the weirdest things on the screen. So they can hook you up with me if you have questions. And I do talk to people, I try to be really helpful. So here's some great resources. Uh, for newborn screening. And um, I really, really like Baby's First Test. That is very um, user-friendly. Um, that one is actually written to be able to be used by um, parents or just general public. Although I use it all the time myself because it has a great comprehensive list of what's on the screen, all the different names for every crazy disease that's on the screen because a lot of the weird diseases that are on the screen have like five names. And um, so those are all listed in that. So that baby's first test has some really great stuff. And you can also see like if you're wondering if your patient was born elsewhere in a different state and you want to know what screen in that state, you can easily look it up. It's very slick. Um, the Department of Public Health has a lot of good resources on newborn screening. Um, specifically, if you have any questions about um, some of the more 
public health legal stuff, they have some great stuff on, you know, refusal forms. If somebody wants to, um, if somebody has questions about the legality or whatever, that's all on there. They also have a bunch of just great resources for doctors about what to do. Um, and also there's resources for how to report abnormal hearing screen results and some of that kind of stuff. Um, the CDC has a great website. So gene reviews, if you don't know about gene reviews, gene reviews is the best genetics textbook available. It is the one we all use. It is free, it is online, and it is searchable. And it doesn't just pertain to newborn screening. If you have somebody walk into your office, some wackadoo genetic disorder, if you just Google gene reviews, or you can go, it's, as you can see, it's the NIH. But if you go, if you Google gene reviews and then you get this up and you type whatever weird condition, strange disorder, those things that nobody can say, but I practice saying, type it right in that box. And you get a, um, a continuously updated, peer-reviewed, usually they're written by the expert on whatever that disease is. And they've got, not only do they have how you diagnose it, when to suspect it, they even have management. It is so hard to find management for rare genetic diseases. Most articles on rare genetic diseases are like, this is how you suspect it. This might be how you diagnose it. And nothing about what you should do for your patient or any of those kinds of questions, which when you're a healthcare provider, yeah, I need to know what they have. I also need to know what to do. So... I just, this is just my little plug for gene reviews. This doesn't even have to be for newborn screening. Just if you have a weird genetics patient and you need to know what's going on. Really good resource. Um, Orphanet is also great for really, really rare diseases if you just need information about a really rare disease. There are more diseases in Orphanet than there are in gene reviews. Because to get in gene reviews, you have to be common enough that there's actually like a consensus for management and that kind of stuff. But so these two are really good for just looking up if you get, you know, weird report, you just need a quick look up. What even is this? You know, carnitine acyl, carnitine translocase deficiency, what? So, um, all right. That's my uh, spiel. I think I'm ready for questions. I don't know how the questions work. Is the cost of the screening, is the cost of the screening covered by the state? No. So that's an excellent question. So the question was, is the cost of screening covered by the state, just in case the online people can't hear or whatever. So in Iowa, our screen is fee-based. So we charge a fee for the blood spot. Um, the state lab charges a fee to the hospital for the blood spot, which is then billed to the insurance. But it's part of the DRG. So in a way, it kind of comes up from the hospital. It, you, know, you know how DRGs work. So, but it's part of the newborn bill. <laughs> So in Iowa, we are, but others, there are other states do have um, state tax allocations, but newborn screening is not tax funded at all in the state of Iowa. It's fee based entirely, which is a strength of the program, actually. Well, what is the, uh, in general, what's the incidence of PKU, congenital uh, hearing loss, and congenital hypothyroidism? I cannot tell you off the top of my head. I have a terrible time remembering statistics. Um, PKU is extremely rare. I think it's less than one in 40,000 at birth. Congenital hypothyroidism is significantly more common. I do not remember how common, however. Congenital hypothyroidism is probably, it, it kind of depends how you count hearing loss, but you're right, hearing loss and congenital hypothyroidism are probably two of the more common things that we would pick up on the screen. Um, they're significantly more common than any of the metabolic diseases are all from like rare to ridiculously rare. Uh, so um, yeah, but that's a good question. I'm sorry, I can never remember incidences. And I can't tell you how many times somebody tried to teach them to me and I'd put them in and they just fall right back out. So I'd have to have it written down right here for you, but I don't. So um, let's see, I probably could estimate it because we get like, probably six or eight a year, and there's about 40,000 births a year in Iowa, so it's a little better than that for PKU. I can't tell you how many positive hearing screens and thyroid screens we get a year, though, off the top of my head. Why are you only screening 95% of the newborns? Pardon? Why are you only screening 95% of the newborns? So, 95, so... 
the question was, why are we only screening 95% newborns? We actually screen more than, m much more than 95% of Iowa newborns are screened. Um, some, we have a baby matching procedure that we go through, um, I think it's done weekly, it's done weekly. So um, one of our staff compares newborn screens with, with birth records. And that's how we know who we've missed. We don't miss very, we hardly, hardly any babies are ever missed. We do get some refusals. It's an opt out program. So parents are allowed to refuse. They have to sign a piece of paperwork, which I think we actually brought a sample of along if somebody wants to look at that. We have um, some information up in the back for people to look at. Um, so it's an opt out program. So if the parents don't refuse, then it's done. And the vast majority of Iowa babies are screened. Although in Switzerland, they get five, one, two, three, four, five refusals a year. Because I talked to um, one of the, uh, the medical director for newborn screening for Switzerland, and he said, oh, we get five refusals a year. And I'm like, 5%? He's like, no, five. One, two, three, four, five. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. So, but I think people in Switzerland are a little bit more adherent with government regulations than your average U.S. citizen maybe is. So they're a little more pro-government there, I think, than we are. So, um, and refusals are usually, um, it usually represents a little bit of distrust of the government programming and public health and stuff like that. So. Your rates. Pardon? Hearing is one to three out of 1,000 babies. Hearing is. One to three. One to three out of one, every 1,000 babies has hearing problems. Right. Okay. So CH is one in every two to four thousand, and hearing is over one in a thousand. So, babies for CES is a great resource. We got a question. How much does it cost for our, an individual? Our our current newborn screening fee is one hundred and twenty two dollars. Thank you. Per the, that's what the charge for the spot card is. Repeats are free. So if you send one, if one gets sent and there's something wrong with it or you need a repeat for some reason, the repeat is free. So the charge is only for the first specimen. And um, being fee-based as opposed to being um, state tax allocation based really provides a lot of stability for a program is one of the reasons we have such a high quality program. Because as you know, if something's allocation funding based, then you've, you can get a lot of stress on the program. Those are all really great questions. Oh, we got another question? I have a question. I'm just to talk. Thank you for it. It was very nice. Thank uh, you. Cystic fibrosis. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm scanning the first half of the talk to see if you addressed that, I, and I didn't spot it. Can you I only that? mentioned that it's on the screen. I didn't talk about it in detail. Um, what's your question about cystic fibrosis? Well, you know, there's so many variants, so many genetic mutations yes. that give rise to that. And, yes. you know, the sweat test theoretically should catch all of them. And yes. I understand this little, you know, drop of blood will catch the huge majority. Yeah. Just I wonder if you could speak to the sensitivity of the testing for CF and when it was implemented and that kind of stuff. So um, I don't remember what year CF was implemented. It's one of the relatively more recent things on this screen. So you're absolutely right. So cystic fibrosis is a great example disorder of some of the issues of newborn screening. So um, one of the things that you really need to do newborn screening is an easy test, a cheap, easy test. And CF doesn't really have a cheap, easy test. So most people, most states start the screen for CF by looking at immunoreactive trypsinogen levels, which is evaluating kind of that gut mal malfunction. But um, I don't know how many like peds providers are in here, but babies who get meconium ileus, which is a severe complication of cystic fibrosis in the newborn period, actually have lower IRT levels. So that's a problem with IRT. And then you get a lot of false positives for IRT. So most states do some combination of an IRT as an initial screen and then reflex to some level of testing of the CFTR, which is the gene associated with cystic fibrosis. We do an IRT cutoff followed by common CFTR mutations. If we detect one at least one CFTR mutation, then we'll bring that child in for a sweat test. And so, because that means they are at least a carrier. And we're constantly looking at this because depending on your population, you know, if you're doing just common mutations, you can miss people. 
But we try to, with our mutations, and you know, we crafted our mutation panel to look at Iowa's population. And it looks like kids with cystic fibrosis in Iowa will have at least one of the mutations that are on the panel. So that's how we do it. I would like to move towards comprehensive gene sequencing, but you're right. That brings up the issue of these weird variants and cystic fibrosis related metabolic, is metabolic, what is it? CRMS, cystic, cystic, CFTR related metabolic, CRM, metabolic syndrome, I think is what that stands for. So like you're I don't really have cystic fibrosis, but my cystic fibrosis transmembrane receptors aren't really quite working right either. And then what do you do with those people? You know, because one of the criteria is we need to know whether you're going to get sick. Like if you're really going to be a good numerous screening disorder, I need to know whether you're going to get sick. And then you start to move into the, I don't know whether you're going to get sick. And cystic fibrosis was one of the ones that, um, you know, because it's important to put something on the screen only if you need to know before somebody develops symptoms. Like there's no reason to screen for strep throat because I don't need to treat you for strep throat before your throat is sore. I can wait till you come and be like, doc, this is the worst sore throat I've ever had, you know? So if you're looking at that question of with cystic fibrosis, the original argument was, yeah, we need to know if people have it, but we can wait till they have symptoms. Um, and I don't have any idea how they got this through the IRB, but Wisconsin, the state of Wisconsin, put cystic fibrosis on their newborn screen as a pilot. They cut them into two groups, the kids that tested positive. They let half of them know, and they didn't tell the other half, and then they tracked them. And the babies who were newborn screened did had much better lung function at some time in late childhood. I can't remember exactly when. And that's why they, that's where we got the decision to put CF on the newborn screen was that newborn screening actually made a big difference on lung function in late childhood. And then also now we know in adulthood, I have absolutely no idea how they got that through our, their IRB though. None. I still don't know. I don't, I mean, it's a great test. I mean, it's a blinded, they did a blinded study, um, but we usually can't do blinded studies of newborn screening. So yeah, but excellent question. CF runs into all of, it makes all of the issues into a nice nutshell. Anything else? I think we're done with time.